welcome back to my channel. My name is Tara and this is another video in my series for my English 750 class, Topics in Textual Criticism, Information, Literacy, and Revolution Across the 14th Century. This week we're embarking on a journey with Piers Plowman, an allegorical narrative poem by William Langland written in roughly the 1370s or 1380s. Records weren't as exact back then as they are now. So first, I really enjoy this poem. Even though the allegorical elements are, are sometimes rather confusing, though always thought-provoking. I first read this for a survey class on Brit British literature at the University of Kentucky, but it's excellent to revisit once more, which I was actually pretty excited about when I saw it on the syllabus. Also, last time I read it in Middle English, and this time in Modern English, so it was just two totally different experiences. I think I did understand uh, quite a bit more this time around, thankfully. So I first wanted to talk briefly about the portrayal of merchants, craftsmen, specifically clothers, and Pierce plowmen, and how some of their entrepreneurial nature that operate outside of guild design sometime might have been seen as immoral by Langland, perhaps even bordering on irredeemable since merchants are left out of definitely getting a full pardon and clothers are seen as suspect within the text. Piers even states, quote, Merchants in the margin had many years grace, but the Pope would grant them no pardon apona et a culpa, end quote, meaning the pardon from punishment and guilt, like the other professions, seemingly singling out the merchants. All right, with that in mind, Supervision and management were important in the 14th century because the Black Death eventually resulted in, quote, new standards and contractual rig rigor on crafts and labor of all kinds, indirectly but rapidly tightening legal controls over the lower social caste that carried these out. This trend parallels Langland's continual concerns not just with craft and labor as such, but also with who is governing and organizing such endeavors, for what ends and under what supervision." End quote. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. So thinking about the idea of supervisors in reading the text, I began to think of Piers Plowman and Holy Church as spiritual leaders or supervisors of the folk from the field and the dreamer Will himself. Piers is going to leave the folk on a metaphorical pilgrimage of contributing work and plowing, plowing the field, as well as perhaps physically to lead them to truth and salvation. Holy Truth, on the other hand, acts to guide Will through his dreams, perhaps even leading him to some kind of enlightenment. This uh, then begs the question, are they adequate and righteous leaders? Are they trustworthy supervisors in terms of these operations being morally sound? Or does the text set up an unfortunate hypocrisy with our spiritual leaders being potentially immoral supervisors, while at the same time pointing out that craftspeople and merchants might also have or be immoral supervisors? Is it instead a complex allegorical criticism by Langland to detail that every chain of people will somehow have inadequate leadership or organization, even those that are supposed to be most holy? All right. So how are Pierce Plowman and Holy Church potentially hypocritical? It seems the moral of the story thus far is to work hard through truth and repent for your sins. If this is the case, shouldn't Pierce Plowman and Holy Church repent for their sins as well to be good examples for their followers? So let's investigate. For example, the Holy Holy Church seems to be envious of Mead when she gossips about Mead being a bastard and having a false father and then stating, quote, I ought to be higher than her. I came from better parentage. My father is the great God, the giver of all graces, one God without beginning, and I'm his good daughter, end quote, implying that Holy Church is upset that she's not higher and seen as superior to Mead by uh, different folks. There seems to be an aspect of jealousy and envy about these statements, and as we learn later in the text, these are deadly sins that need to be repented. The allegorical envy is described later in the text with, quote, every syllable he spat out was of a serpent's tongue, from chiding to bringing charges was his chief livelihood, end quote. 
And even though this is not all of what Holy Church does by any means, it does seem like she brought charges and accusations and negative speech to Meade. Additionally, on several occasions, Pierce Plowman seems to be filled with wrath and vengeance, such as when he became frustrated with the laziness of some of the folk from the field and calls forth hunger with, quote, Now by the peril of my soul, says Piers, I'll punish them all, end quote. And he whooped after hunger who heard him at once. And Piers said, quote, Avenge these vagabonds, end quote. So, to show how Piers' behavior is potentially inappropriate, Hunger eventually points out, quote, Though they behave ill, leave it all up to God, end quote. And then the text includes the following quote from the Bible, quote, Vengeance is mine, and I will be repay, end quote, showing that it is only God that should seek vengeance against others. This kind of also reminds me of a quote from Matthew that states, quote, Judge not lest ye be judged, end quote. Will God judge Piers and his behavior on Judgment Day? Piers also showed this wrath a second time when he became angry at the priest and tears up the pardon. And the text describes it as, quote, And Piers, for pure wrath, pulled it in two, end quote, talking about the pardon. Additionally, we learned a couple weeks ago with the Golden Legend that sinners can repent and then still even be holy saints, such as the tale of Mary Magdalene. So there isn't a reason peers in Holy Church couldn't repent and then continue on with their journeys. However, I continue to wonder why our spiritual leaders are able to sin without consequence and without repentance while instructing others to repent for these same crimes. Maybe there's something to do with quantity. And I guess I'm sticking with this theological theme from last week. Um, I suppose it fits since the 14th century seems just absolutely draped in Christianity. But thinking about this potential hypocrisy a little more, it seems like Langland is very deliberate in his text and probably wouldn't make any unintended inconsistencies. Therefore, I'm thinking there's maybe allegorical meaning to all that I stated earlier. There's also the idea that humans are supposed to be made in God's images, as claimed in the Bible with this quote, God created man in his own image, end quote. And, uh, you know, God is certainly wrathful and envious himself. For example, I'm thinking of when God became fed up with humanity and created the Great Flood or sent sulfur and fire to destroy Sodom. This isn't unlike Piers himself acting in this sort of way when he seeks hun hunger to, the, to punish the field of folk, or with holy church and envy. The Christian God does sure seem to get jealous and insecure if you worship another deity or have false idols. It seems that he needs people to worship him and can't stand if they just don't. Just like holy church can't stand if people prefer mead over her. Hey, I, I did say in the last video that I was baptized Greek Orthodox. But I never said I was still practicing. Anyway, those are my thoughts on Piers Plowman and Holy Church being potentially flawed spiritual leaders or supervisors in the text of Piers Plowman, which could mirror Langland's commentary on immoral supervisors in a variety of trades and crafts in the 14th century. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you next time.